Recording. Recording is on. Cool. So. Uh, okay. So does everyone have the uh, terminal, a terminal downloaded or do you have access to one on the computer that you're using? Cool. All right. Um, so let's get started then. Uh, so this is a intro to Linux class. It's Sunday, May 3rd, 2020. We are stuck at home because of the coronavirus, but uh, we're still learning anyway. So um, uh, it's brought to you by Hive76. Um, so this is uh, just the intro. This is Talks. He is the, um, um, he's like the, the mascot of Linux and he's walking welcoming us to this uh, this class. So we'll learn how to do that command a little bit later today. Uh, just a quick overview of the agenda. We'll be going through some introductions, setup, um, and overview of the class and what we'll be covering and what we won't be covering. There's a lot of stuff um, with Linux and uh, a lot of different avenues we can go down. We're gonna be just focusing on getting the server set up and getting the basics under, under your belt. Um, it will be going through a quick history of Linux and operating systems in general. Uh, we'll have a quick break, then we'll go through deploying the server um, on Linode. Uh, if you didn't, if you don't want to make an account, then we'll just watch that part. Um, we'll go through some like basic commands of navigating the file system, and yeah, uh, we'll have another another break, and then we'll go through setting up like a firewall and um, basic application and then we'll have time to begin for questions. But at any point during this, please feel free to interrupt me for questions. I find it a lot better for like the flow of the, of the class and, um, and uh, that way we can direct the class like with the level that everyone's at. Um, so with that, uh, about me. So I am a systems engineer at Linode. Um, I started off as a, admin assistant at this really small company and worked my way up. I was a project manager for a couple of years and recently became a systems engineer uh, about five months ago now. Um, I love Linux. I've loved it since I was first introduced to it, uh, which was back when I was an admin assistant and I've been using it ever since. Uh, my Twitter is cpuck. I mostly tweet Linux memes and like, uh, <laughs> Uh, retweeting my employer, Linode. Uh, they're also like sponsoring it. So that's how we got the promo credit. So thank you to, to them for giving us that. And um, yeah, I wanted to, um, everyone on the call, if everyone could just like go around real quickly and say their name and why they're interested in, in learning Linux and maybe just like a brief, like, you know, to give me a baseline of where everyone's at. So, um, Oh, hey, hey there. Uh, my name's David. I uh, live in South Philly, and uh, I'm a full stack uh, web developer, uh, predominantly freelance. And um, I'm just here because I wanted to uh, expand my skill set, and I feel like uh, between AWS and Heroku and Bluehost, I don't really know much else about uh, serving applications to the web. And this seemed like a great opportunity to sort of take more control of that aspect of my uh, work. Cool. Uh, I can, no one else will. Uh, hi, I'm Tom, I'm from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I'm here mostly because I was interested in learning a little bit of Linux. Uh, honestly, I'm more an enthusiast than a full-on professional, but uh, I'm just here to learn how to set up servers, and maybe that way I can start hosting some Minecraft stuff on the side. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. I'll go next. Uh, my name's Ian. I live in West Philly. I just moved here from Chicago, and I've been trying to just up, up my skill set, kind of like David was saying. Uh, I'm, I also primarily work as a web developer, and I 
I think just the open source software is, I think, very important, very cool. So being able to work with Linux, I think, is a valuable skill. Cool. I think um, I see someone talking, but I don't hear Gary. I think that might be you. Maybe. Uh, maybe you can type in the chat. Yeah, I still can't hear you. Um, <laughs> Hi, Gary. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, yeah, we can use the chat if, uh, oh, nice. Very cool. Raspberry Pi is great. Yeah, I want to get one because I'm so bored. <laughs> I wanted to make a home server with all of our movies. Yeah, you should do it. Yeah. It's a great project at the local library. Cool. That's great. Cool. Yeah, Python's great. Um. Cool. Nice. Nice. Yeah, that would be great. Well, hopefully, um, the server that you set up will be a good starting ground for that. <laughs> I, think, I think it will be. So. Cool. Great. Thanks for joining, Gary. Oh, wow. Welcome. <laughs> Cool. I suppose you then saw the uh, ad from Linode on the Twitter, if you're joining from not so, not Philadelphia. Yeah, that's what I figured. Oh, that's great. Glad you were able to join. Um, okay, so uh, I think Jay Fred, you didn't go yet, right? Oh yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm John. I'm also in Philly. Uh, and I'm a DevOps engineer at Linode. Um. Cool. Um, so I said this in the beginning, but uh, we'll be using a Linode server for this demo for the class. Um, promo code, I'll send it again in the chat right now. Um, yeah, uh, it's Linode 526 is the promo code. Um, if you don't want to create an account, yeah, let me know. Um, that's totally fine. So, if you have any trouble with that, also let me know. I can help you out. Uh, we'll be using a terminal to connect to our servers today for the demo um, and for the like hands-on exercise. We'll be using, um, or if you're on Windows, MOBA Xterm works pretty well. Um, and if you're on Mac, there's a default terminal, but iTerm2 also works pretty well. Uh, I mentioned to you that you may want to also install Homebrew um, because uh, that uh, for future things that makes, makes it, that makes it easier to install stuff. So, um, but we won't be going over that. Today, I'll bring it up quite a bit. So, is, is Homebrew necessary for what we're doing, or can we use like Yarn or NPM? Yeah, you, you don't need to download it. I I put it there because. I think it might be useful for future stuff after after you're done this class. But um, since it's a package manager, we'll be talking about how how package managers work. But uh, you don't need to install it. So um, okay, cool. So the goal of this class is really just to be an entry point into the world of open source. Uh, we'll also be going over like 
core concepts of Linux and um, basic command for navigating the file system. That's um, basically like, you know, on a Windows computer uh, or and on a Mac computer, um, navigating the file system is like going through, you know, your finder thing here. But we'll be doing that on the command line. Um, but this is in concepts. Uh, we'll also be downloading packages from the package manager app and hopefully we'll be leading the class with something tangible that you can build off of for whatever project you're working on. So we'll be leading with a server and um, some knowledge on how to set that up and make sure it's secure. So um, some things that we're not going to be covering in this class that you may want to look into further after is um, how to troubleshoot working issues. Um, it, that's kind of like a big rabbit hole to go down and potentially could be a, an entire other class, but uh, we're not going to be touching that today. We're just going to be going through the setup and how to how to uh, set up our server. But that's a, another thing that you could potentially look into after. Um, we won't be going over web protocols or how, how ports work. I will be mentioning them because it is important for our setup of the server, but if you want to know more about that, you can look it up on Google after the documentation. We won't be going over system D. Um, this is something that's in most Linux um, distributions, which we'll also be talking about. But we'll go through some basic commands that you need to know for our application demo. Um, we won't be going into the in-depth structure of Linux or the Linux kernel. That's, that, again, is like a whole other topic that you can research more if you're interested. Uh, we won't be using Linux as a desktop computer. Um, but if you are interested in that, we did teach another class about almost two years ago exactly. Um, and I've linked the notes um, for that in in this slide here. This, these slides I'll also be putting on after. Um, Okay, yeah, we're going to be talking about SSH a lot. So that's going to be our first uh, command that we do. So it's tight. We'll, we'll get there soon, I promise. Um, uh, we're also not going to be talking about um, BSD or Unix. That's another topic. But there are some similarities. If you're running a Mac machine, then um, some of the stuff that you learn in this class, you'll be able to do on, just on your computer. So. So uh, the history of the new Linux, the new Linux. Um, before we get into that, I wanted to cover just briefly why, why Linux. Why, why would you be interested in, in running Linux? What are the same advantages? Um, we'll be talking about this a little bit more in depthly, but one of the big ones is that it's free and open source, which means that in order to use it, you just need to have the hardware and access to download it. It enables beginners and advanced users to quickly spin up websites for their project. Um, um, and um, it's audited by thousands of people from all around the world. Because it's open source, that means it's really accessible. And, um, and the code can be viewed by anyone who's interested in looking at it. It can also contribute, and that's audited by a team of people. Um, but it's uh, it's compared to like closed source software like you find in like Microsoft or, or Mac, it's um it's it's really available. So uh, by default it's kind of more secure. Um, it runs most of the world's websites, including this one. So the application that we're using to connect to this class is called Jitsi. And Jitsi runs on Linux and I know that because I set up a Jitsi server myself um, and was hosting it with Linode. But it, it, it was running Linux. So most things that you're going to be interacting with on, on the web are running Linux or running uh, some of the web servers that we're going to be going over a little bit later. But um, that's a big reason to, to want to know how to use it and, and to you know, get familiar with how it works. Um, so this is a pretty famous um, sticker that you'll find on a lot of people's laptops. But it's going to make a little bit more sense later, but one of the key concepts um, about um, servers that I wanted to talk about is that uh, it's really just a computer somewhere some, somewhere else. Um, it's running the same hardware that you're using to connect to um, this meeting right now on your computer, but it's just somewhere else. So a lot of this stuff you can do locally, but it, 
the, the point I really wanted to drive home with that is that it's not as scary as it seems. It's really just a computer somewhere else. It's not as abstract. Um, so yeah, diving into the history of that, um, of Linux. Um, before Linux, Microsoft, uh, DOS, MS-DOS, and Unix dominated the OS market. Um, both were proprietary and very expensive. Um, much of the hardware and software was not compatible with each other. I'm mostly referring to this period in the 80s where a lot of uh, different, there's a lot of different like computing companies that like sprung up. If you ever watched the show Halt and Catch Fire, this kind of like goes into that. And a lot of like reverse engineering was happening to get stuff to work on other systems. There was lots of different like protocols for like even connecting to the internet, uh, unlike what we have today. Um, and uh, a lot of stuff was not compatible with each other. So this bugged a lot of people because not only was the hardware expensive, but software was expensive. And it made it really difficult for someone who was just starting out or didn't have a lot of money uh, to be able to access these technologies and you know learn from them. And, yeah. So um, in 1984, the new project was established by Richard Stallman. Uh, it's a recursive, recursive acronym for GNU's not Unix. Um, hey Fred, do you know what GNU actually stands for? Is it just? <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that's it. Yeah. Okay. It's... That's what I thought. But yeah. Oh, I think I oh, lost. I uh, yeah, I lost you, Christine. Yeah. How about now? Yeah. Now we're good. I think I clicked it by accident. Um, but the aim was uh, the aim was um, develop a Unix-like operating system. But the difference was that it was for free for copying and modification. Uh, Stallman built the first free GNU C compiler in 1991, but there was not an operating system to to um, there was not an operating system yet for it to work with. So in the same year, um, oh, yeah, before we get to that, this is also another thing that you will find at most tech conferences. Um, this is a t-shirt that says run GCC. That's like a new C compiler. Um, and uh, that's quite funny, so I included it in there. But in the beginning, um, the beginning of Linux started in September 1991 when Linus Torvalds a uh, student at the University of Helsinki, which is actually where one of uh, one of us is from, which is pretty cool. Um, he developed the pre preliminary kernel of Linux known as 0.0.1. .0 .1. It was released October 5th, 1991, and it was basically the beginning of the Linux kernel, which um, combined with various software compilers uh, from the GNU project that we mentioned before formed the OS called GNU Linux. So um, another big thing to come out of this a little bit later on, I don't know exactly when, but it was a couple years after Linux was developed, was the Git project. And um, when Linus released uh, Linux to the world, there was a lot of interest in contributing and collaborating on it. And um, there wasn't a great way. I mean, there was version control software. Git gets a version control piece of software. Um, there, there was version control before that, but um, lots of artifacts in line. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually hearing that too. Mm -hmm. Maybe could everyone else mute? I think it's something with your mic. Okay, let me switch my mic. Uh, one second. Is this better? Um, no. A little, but yeah. Like your voice is a little bit more clear, but there are still a lot of artifacts. I have, I have this like new microphone, so I'm just trying to try and get out. Hello. Hello. Uh. Give it a I, shot. Yeah, the artifacts are mostly gone. Okay. How about uh, uh, no. Yeah, no. Nah. It it, it seems it seems more of a distortion issue. Okay. 
either connection or the gain is maybe too high on the mic. Is that better? No. Oh, no. How about that? Uh, <laughs> my headphones. One second. Sorry, this is bound to happen. Oh, good. I have a uh, piece of you should work pretty well. Yeah, that that's working. Yeah, that's much better. Mm -hmm. okay, cool. Cool. I'm gonna unplug. How about now? Yeah, that's that's yep. wonderful. Okay, great. It's funny that this like hundred dollar microphone is far worse than my crappy uh, headphones that I got for free. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, technology, am I right? Mm. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, basically the beginning, beginning of uh, this was like the beginning of the, the Linux kernel. Some sound taken from good now. Okay, cool. So, um, so Linux today it's used for many computing platforms, PCs, servers, embedded devices. Embedded devices are like routers, transit kiosks, etc. Some of the notable ones, if you're in Philadelphia um, and have ever taken a uh, ride on SEPTA before, the transit kiosk actually run on Linux. And I know this because a couple of times I've seen uh, the like error messages and prompts for uh, Linux uh, things on, on their kiosk when they're like er erroring out, which is kind of neat, but there's tons of things like that in the world uh, that we use every day and that are out in the world or at home, like our routers, for example, uh, usually run on Linux or some kind of like stripped down version of Linux. So um, yeah, this is a little tux. Uh, I have a miniature tux here somewhere. I don't know where he went, but um, this is like the mascot of Linux and um, you'll, once you start like searching stuff online, you'll see you'll see them a lot. These cute little penguin. So, um, free software. I uh, wanted to talk about this a little bit, but does anyone have any questions so far? Okay. Um, oh. So, free software is defined by the Free Software Foundation as a matter of liberty, not price. And to qualify as free software. You have to be able to run any program that you want um, rather than be restricted in what you can or run the program for any purpose that you want rather than be restricted for what you can use for. You have to be able to share the program with others and be able to improve upon the program and release it, whether you release it to the program that the original program or if you like fork it off and create create a new one yourself. The goal, the goal of free software is that you should be able to do with it what you want and um, and not be restricted in what you can use it for. So this is like some of the key principles behind behind um, free software and Linux by extension. Um, there are some distributions that we'll talk about that that um, do stray away from this a little bit, but um, for the most part, these are the the core foundations. So um, this is one aspect that I really love about Linux is that it is free. Uh, free software and it is open source and it's accessible to not just um, you know big companies that use it, but it's accessible to you know people like you and me who are just trying to like start a project or host an application, etc. So, um, so I want to talk about operating systems a little bit, um, just to give you like a very very brief overview. Um, I'm trying to find where my notes are because I had some speaker notes, but I am not great at Google Slides. So just give me one minute here. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So <clears throat> the operating system OS for short is the interface between hardware and the user. 
So this is um, basically like uh, uh, like um, the thing that's like the operating system is, is the thing that is you're using to communicate with the hardware. So it also manages computers, memory processes, software, and hardware. Um, some of the most popular operating systems are Windows, which many of you are using, um, Mac OS, which is what I'm using, and uh, Linux, which is what we're talking about today. So um, when a user uses a computer, they're most of the time connecting to an application to access something. So a good example to use is like the Chrome browser. So if you're using Chrome to access the internet, you're using an application um, to, to access the internet. And when you're using that application, it has to interact with the operating system um, in order to uh, communicate certain things that need to happen at the application level. So if we're going with our Chrome example, if you're on, if you're on Chrome and you want to connect to YouTube to watch a video, your computer has to output the sounds from that video, um, and they do that uh, through your speakers. And the way that the application knows where your speakers are and how to access them to output the sound is via the operating system. So that kind of handles that like in between. And this is why I have like the arrows in between, like the user, the application, the operating system, because it all flows back back up to the user and what they're experiencing. And um, and then at the end, I have the hardware because. If the operating system said, hey, um, Chrome is telling me that I need to output sound into because this person is watching YouTube, but there isn't the speakers there to output the sound, then it would just do nothing. So it all kind of like, this is like the whole, um, the whole flow of like how a user will be interacting with the hardware. Um, there's certain layers in between, uh, but the operating system is like the core middleman. So does that make sense to everyone? Cool. All right. Um, so Linux, as an operating system, is mostly written in C. Um, there are different <clears throat> distributions. Um, sometimes it's shortened to distro, so you'll hear me kind of going back and forth on using those terms. But some of the most popular ones are uh, uh, Ubuntu, Debian, Red Hat, CentOS, um, and basically, at the heart of it, it's really just a bunch of files and folders uh, that are doing stuff. But um, for the most part, you can interact with things directly, um, just you, just navigating the files and manipulating them. Um, there, in Linux distributions, there's a thing called the Package Manager, and that's used to be able to download programs. Like in our Chrome example, you can you would be downloading Chrome, but you would be doing that from the terminal rather than going on to another web browser to download Chrome. Um, Linux is both a server and a desktop, and we'll talk about a little bit of both of them um, right now, So, uh, or after this slide. <clears throat> so distributions, um, I just wanted to give an overview of a couple of them. So Red Hat Linux is a commercial Linux distribution. A lot of big corporations use this. They'll use this or CentOS, which is kind of like the free version of Red Hat, but it uses a package manager called Yum. We're not going to be using that in our demo today, but I just wanted to point that out because it is a really popular one. It tends to have really stable releases. So I think the current one is eight, maybe, or seven. Um, but uh, they tend to last for like a really, really long time. So um, a lot of companies rely on them because they are so stable. But they are, they are also not technically free. Red Hat at least isn't. Um, so another popular one is Debian. Um, this is a free software distro. It's very popular for servers. It's the one we're going to be using today, for our example. Um, Ubuntu is a more user-friendly derivative of Debian. So there's some, some setbacks with Debian that make it a little bit more difficult to use. However, I think that it depends on what you're using it for. This I've mostly found this if you're trying to set up like a computer desktop version, but um, Ubuntu is is definitely probably it's probably one of the most popular Linux distributions. I don't have any facts to back that up, but <laughs> um, but it's 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 popular for a reason because 
at least for people starting out on Linux, Ubuntu is usually the one I would recommend. But I do personally prefer Debian. Uh, Gen 2, I wanted to point this one out. It's mostly meant for like programmers and stuff. Um, same as Arch, well, not really programmers per se, but it's kind of like a bare bones Linux distribution. You gotta do a lot of stuff yourself. People like that. Um, oh, that's why a lot of people pick Linux, so, but it is quite difficult if you're first starting out. I would not recommend it, <laughs> but I, I do personally also like it. So um, if later on in your Linux journey, if you're um, filling up to trying it out, you should, you should give it a try. Um, <clears throat> wanted to talk about security a little bit. So security has always been the number one priority in Linux. Um, I mentioned this before, but having open source packages and libraries make it very easy to audit the code and ensure that nothing's malicious. Um, there was a incident that happened about maybe three or four years ago, I can't remember now, but in Windows, I think it was Windows 10, that someone um, had found a back door into the operating system and um, were able to like do malicious stuff. And a lot of these kind of things happen because the code isn't freely available. On Linux, this doesn't happen as often. I'm not gonna say it does not happen, but when it does happen, it's usually patched pretty quickly. And um, it's definitely less frequent and less less large than it seems to happen on Mac OS or on, on Windows. Um, Mac had a similar one a couple of years back where you were able to log into your a MacBook computer as a root user and root is like the we'll talk about that a little bit later too but root is like the the highest privileged user that you can have on a computer they can do whatever whatever you want um, or whatever they want and there's no there's no real restrictions and you are able to log in as root without a password which is very very bad <laughs> so um, that means that anyone could log into your computer with no password and do whatever they want so um, but yeah, peer auditing ensures that many eyes, um, instead of like a siloed view, uh, are on are on the code, which is which makes for a better product. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the package manager. This is how we install programs on Linux. You can, if you're using a desktop, download graph like the kind of the same way that you would now on your computer. But most of the time, you're going to be using the package manager. And this is based around a list of sources that you have. Uh, we'll, I'll show you where this is later when we're working on a server together. But um, the, the source list basically says like, this is where, this is a trusted place where I can download stuff from. So instead of like, you know, going to a website on your computer and being like, I wanna download this, but I'm not really sure if it's safe. The package manager, if you're downloading something that's from this source, is gonna, it's like a kind of like verifying that, that it's okay to download. So um, you can edit the source list and then download stuff from other places, but but the the ones by default and the ones that are supported um, at, from the distribution, if you go on their website, they're, they're generally very, very safe. A couple of different types of package managers are uh, what I have listed here, apt, yum, Pac-Man, Homebrew, Chocolate, that's used for Windows. I've never actually used that, but I do know it exists, so it's there. Windows also has this thing where you can run Ubuntu on Linux, or Ubuntu on Windows now, which is really cool. Um, I haven't personally tried it out, but I do know that it's there, so that might be something you want to experiment with. But apt is used for Ubuntu and Debian. Yum is for Red Hat and CentOS. Pac-Man is Arch. Homebrew is Mac OS, like I said. And one of the great things about a package manager is that it installs dependencies. So if you're downloading a program, most of the time it will incorporate dependencies into there. But what the, yeah, Raspbian, Raspbian is actually a derivative of Debian. So it's gonna be using the same package manager. So you'll be a little bit familiar with that, which is, which is great, um, Gary. Um, but it installs dependencies. So we'll take a look at your system and and it knows from the package that it will say like, hey, I need 
this version of Python or, hey, I need this version of this library. And we'll look at your system and, and say, hey, um, I see you want to download this package, but I also see that you don't have these. So we're going to download them too. Do you want to do that? You can say no, but then you will probably end up with a broken package, <laughs> which isn't what you want. So you're going to usually say yes. Um, it also places everything where it needs to be, which is great. So if you're installing something, um, it could happen that like maybe something's not in the right place, but a package manager is great because it, 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 it knows where it needs to be and it puts it there. It also keeps track of what you downloaded. So if you need to update, which we'll go through later, but if you need to update your server, it, it will automatically know, you know what you downloaded, what needs to be upgraded, and do that for you. So the Bash shell is um, what we're going to be using today. It's one of probably the most common shell, uh, but basically it's what you're connecting to when you're using the terminal. So the terminal um, is the, the thing that we downloaded earlier is what we call a client. And um, the thing that we're going to be connecting to is called the server. And the client is is basically like, if you want to think about it in terms of an analogy, I think this is a pretty good one. But the, the client is kind of like you're the uh, waiter in a restaurant and you're going to the kitchen, which is the server, and then the waiter brings back the food to you. And I think that that's a, that's a pretty good example of kind of basically how client and server work. But the 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 client terminal is actually connecting to a shell, which is the bash shell. And this passes along to the operating system, the, the commands to carry out. So um, I don't want to get like too much further down that, but that's basically what you're going to be connecting to. It stands for um, born again shell. And the reason it's called this is because the person who made it was called, his name was Stephen Born or Steve Born. And it was, it replaced uh, another shell called SH, which was the one of the, one of the first, I don't know if it was the first, but it was an early on one. And um, so that's why they called it born again, but it's kind of like a pun, but, but yeah, so this is what we'll be using today um, on your Linux server. Usually it's by default, the, the bash shell, but it's important for later on. Um, so I wanted to mention and give you an overview. Uh, term, term, terminal emulators is um, what we used and what we downloaded today in order to interact with the shell, which is how we interact with the server. So this is usually just called a terminal though. Uh, but it's the graphical application that we use to interact with um, the server. So when you launch a terminal, typically you're going to see something like this with a root at localhost. That's kind of the usual default when you're logging into a server. Um, and that's called a shell prompt. And that will appear when the shell is ready to. Um, yeah, putty's fine. Putty's great. Putty's good. Um, <laughs> but this will uh, appear when the shell is ready to accept any kind of command. So when we're running our commands today in our examples, um, we'll be uh, seeing the shell prompt a lot. And that means that it's ready to accept new commands. So uh, the Lynx desktop is a desktop like what I'm using right now. Um, it is uh, targeted at um, it's actually in all of dis most distributions and it's usually comes with like some pre, -ins pre installed software. So like out of the box, you'll get like a music, uh, application. You'll get like a calendar application, a mail application, like the typical things that you get when you install a, or when you get a new computer. Uh, this also will come by default in Linux, but we're not going to be going through a desktop. Uh, we were planning to maybe in the future at Hive have a, a desktop oriented class, but um, for now we're just going to be going through the servers. But I wanted to mention it because one of my favorite stories ever is that my, um, my mom was having computer troubles one time and she was running uh, Windows 10 and 
something happened with her installation where it got messed up and there was like a virus or something and it was like beyond hope. So what I did was I installed a version of Linux that's usually oriented towards Windows users like as a, um, a replacement. It's called um, uh, Mint and I downloaded it for her and I set her up with her Firefox and everything that she's like used to using. And I didn't tell her that I think I did mention that, that I switched the operating system, but she didn't know what I meant because she's not a real tech savvy person. Up until a couple of years ago, she wrote in all caps. So, um, <laughs> um, uh, but she was using it for a week and she was trying to get her printer to work and she called brother's uh, number and uh, the brother software company. Um, and they were trying to troubleshoot with her and then she was like and then she realized she wasn't they they were that she was using linux so and that made me so happy that she for an entire week didn't realize that she was using linux because it was like that that user friendly and that similar to like um uh to when she was using her windows computer so the point the point of the story is that it's not too bad like if you are switching over to linux like you for for most uses, you won't even know the difference. Um, a couple of terminology things I'm going to be referring to today is that a lot of stuff can be referred to uh, that we'll we'll be going through in our demo is the is the command line, um, and that's often referred to as the CLI. Um, and then another term I'll be using is the graphical user interface, which is like, you know, this that's like what it's like the opposite of the terminal. And that's usually referred to as the GUI. If you're into software development, you probably already know these terms, but I wanted to put it out there because it's important to know because there's a lot of acronyms and it can get lost. And yeah, uh, another one is desktop environments. Desktop environments is usually referred to as DE. Um, that we won't be referring to as much. I just wanted to point that one out. If you're looking into setting up a Linux desktop environment um, later on, GUI interface is usually easier, easier to use. It's like what most of Windows and Mac is. And the CLI is similar to that of Phoenix, which is what we'll be using today. I don't have a demo prepared. I'm very sorry. I was going to show a, um, a virtual machine version of a desktop environment. I might try to set that up over one of the breaks that we have, but uh, I don't have it right now. So apologies on that. Uh, last thing, or I think that it, getting close, we're getting close to the break here. So just bear with me a little bit more. Um, two more slides. Uh, I wanted to talk about embedded systems a bit. I think it's pretty cool that a lot of the stuff that we use every day and that, that we depend on for things like internet are using the Linux kernel. A big one, if you have an Android phone that is using a modified version of the Linux kernel, um, mobile devices, smartphones, tablets. I'm not sure about iPhones. I should probably look that up. I don't, I, they're probably using something something else, but uh, smart TVs, if you have a smart TV, that's usually using some weird version of Linux that Samsung like stripped down. Um, routers, uh, different IoT things, especially. I know someone else mentioned that they were doing IoT stuff with Pies. But a lot of the stuff that you buy that's already like configured with IoT things that usually has Linux in it or some some version of Linux. Uh, industrial automation really heavily depends on on Linux. We have some friends at Hive who who do work in that field and they and they do stuff like that. Um, so uh, I wanted to point that out there. I think it's pretty cool that Android does use Linux and you can do a lot of uh, uh, hacking on it. Yeah, robotics kits, like and most of the stuff that you would, you would, any kind of like maker thing that you would buy online, I would, I would bet 10 times out of 10 is going to be Linux. Like, I don't, I don't know what even else they could, they could use if it's some, I guess if it's something proprietary, but, um, and then the last thing I wanted to bring up is servers. So servers host websites like the one we're using now. Um, some common packages for servers are Nginx, Apache 2, and programming languages such as Python or PHP. Uh, a lot of websites, um, I think someone just joined. Oh. Who was it? Bellow Jitzer. 
Um, but a, a lot of common packages are Nginx, Apache 2. These are web servers that run, and this is how uh, you connect to websites. It's it's what manages like uh, who who just joined? Uh, hi, my name is Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Nice to meet uh, you. My name is yeah, Chris my Lee. camera's terrible, and so is my hair. I haven't been out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. I uh, just wanted to let you know that this meeting is recorded, but if you're uncomfortable with that, you can just turn off your camera and use the, the text chat. But um, but yeah, thanks for joining. Um, we're almost through our first half. I'll try to, I'll send you some links to get you set up though for the next half. Um, but the main point, just when I'm close this out that I wanted to talk about is that it's just a computer somewhere else. So it's not as scary as you might think. And uh, and we're back to this image here that I showed in the beginning that there is no cloud. It's just someone else's computer. So this is Amazon, AWS, Linode, DigitalOcean, all of them, Rack Rackspace, all, all of the, cl the cloud hosting providers you can think of. Netflix, they use AWS on their back end. They're just running computers somewhere else that you're now connecting to. And that's what the internet is or the cloud. Um, you have hardware, you have software, and you connect to it somehow. So, and that is the, the first half. Uh, we are at one o'clock right now. I figured we can take until one o five. Um, I will send you some stuff, Ryan, to get you started. Um, and then we can resume and we'll, and the next half we'll be going through some basic commands and uh, accessing a shared server together, which will be fun. Um, and I'm sure that we are going to hit in some problems. So um, I factored that into that this time. So I'm sorry in advance for the troubleshooting that will eventually happen, but that's the kind of downside of meeting not face-to-face. -face. So, but yeah, so we'll resume at 105. Um, I'll see you then. All right. Cool.